I'm Gregory Sams, and I'm going to tell you a few things now which I hope will enhance your appreciation of this cosmic event, the total eclipse of the sun. And the main players in this are the sun and its corona. So start out by telling you a bit about the sun because we live in a strange time where we don't really understand the true nature of this beautiful character that crosses our skies and brings us the light of life every day. Because everywhere you went in the world at one time, the intuitive, natural response of people to the sun was to recognize it as a conscious entity and to accord it divine status. This didn't matter whether it was the Egyptians, the Mayans, or the Greeks, the Celts, the Indians, the Persians, the Japanese. People recognized that this is what brought life to us and that it was alive itself. And it wasn't science that gave us the notion that sun worship was primitive and ignorant at all. It was a very jealous church. And when Christianity became wedded to the Roman Empire, suddenly sun worship became the greatest crime you could commit. It was worse than rape, robbery, or even murder, because this, this threatened the new establishment of the church. Um, and it, the notion was literally burned out of our culture for many centuries, so now it never even crosses our mind, or many people's mind, that maybe the source of life is alive itself. And the science backs it. When you actually look at what we know about the sun and other stars, it fits much better with uh, a living being than with a dumb, dead ball of gas, this accidental light bulb in the sky that just happens to <clears throat> conveniently support us. Because the sun itself and, and other stars are complex. Our sun has seven very distinct different layers to it. They're all doing very different things. Um, of course, you have the fusion reactor at the core, creating the, the energy source of the sun. But then it passes through three more layers in the visible sun. That's the bit that we see dropping over the horizon at sunset. And two of these layers, the radiative zone and the convective zone, they rotate around each other at different speeds, thought to be producing a dynamo-like effect. And the whole sun is permeated with electromagnetic fields. They pop out of sunspots and they cover the, the first invisible layer of the sun. There are these three energetic layers of the sun that we can't see with the naked eye. And the first one is the chromosphere and it's covered with electromagnetic field lines. And sometimes these fields, they'll all join together into one tangled heap of electromagnetic fields, sometimes they spread out. And meanwhile, these sort of red spicules that sort of fly up and down within this zone um, that can be seen with the naked eye only during a total solar eclipse, and even then, it's rare. But as you come out towards the outer reaches of the sun, we then have the sun's corona. This is the outermost layer of the sun. It stretches from one to three million miles into space. It takes up much more area than the whole rest of the sun put together. And solar scientists believe that the corona manages and instigates four of the sun's other unpredictable strange phenomena. And one of these sunspots has been studied by, ever since Galileo identified them, astronomers have been like making a note of sunspot cycles and trying to figure what's going on. The other three are coronal filaments, coronal mass ejections, and solar flares. These four features, um, very interesting features, of the sun. And we now know, because we have satellites on both sides of the sun analyzing it, 
we now know that these are all synchronized, coordinated. They're not just like, you know, the odd fart and belch going off here and there, but these four features are very coherent in their activity. So, so solar scientists believe the sun's corona manages these functions. When you ask them about the sun's corona, they say that is the most mysterious aspect of the sun. And, of course, when you ask philosophers or neuroscientists about the human condition, they will tell you that consciousness, our mind, is the most mysterious aspect of our existence. Now, I would suggest that if the sun is a conscious entity, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, the corona is where its mind is active in this other invisible electromagnetic field that defines it. And the reason we can see this corona during a total eclipse is in the same way that, uh, you know, we see the field lines of a magnet, which are invisible. When we put a sheet of paper and some iron filings on top of it, then we see that pattern. Well, when the sun's light is completely blotted out, 100%, not even 99%, we can see these little particles that spin off of the sun as it turns in its travels. And as the particles that spin off the sun pass through its corona, they get excited. And the electrons in them emit photons, which is what happens when particles are excited. And these little photon emissions are what we see, and they outline the pattern of the corona, which is an ever-changing shape and size on the sun. So this is this magic thing that you get to see. And of course, you know the mechanics. It's because the sun is 400 times as far away from the Earth as the moon and 400 times the diameter of the moon, which is why the moon's disk can perfectly eclipse it at certain times and places. Now, the sun's corona doesn't really end where you see it, because as those charged particles spin off of the sun, they feed into this huge magnetic field called the heliosphere. And this is this giant bubble which encompasses all the planets of the solar system. It ends way beyond Pluto. And it's this protective bubble that we all travel through the galaxy in together at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. And were it not for this bubble, the planets would eventually be eroded by the, by the cosmic rays that are coming in, that would otherwise come in and eat them away. Um, so it's this protective bubble. Uh, we also now know that there is a magnetic portal, they call it, connecting Earth to Sun. And it comes off of the Earth's magnetic field, and it's this magnetic field, the diameter of the Earth, which points towards the Sun's corona. And the Sun's corona has a field coming off of it. And every eight minutes, these two fields join together and make this connective tube through which Solar scientists believe tons of high-energy particles pass back and forth at that eight-minute minute interval. So that's pretty magic, and that doesn't really sound like a dead ball of gas responding to Newtonian principles and nothing else, forming links like this. And we don't know. They could well be links to all the other planets um, that have yet to be discovered. What do we do with electromagnetic fields? Because light is, has a huge spectrum. Our eyes are able to see just a small spectrum of light's wavelength range called visible light. And we've got at one end x-rays. Now we use x-rays to tell us about the bony structure of our body. At the other end, there are radio waves, which we use, of course, to send radio and also another wavelength we use to send television through the air. Um, as we learn more and more about the electromagnetic 
spectrum, we're able to use it to send all the data that goes to our smartphones. That's light, that's photons being used to transmit that information through more electromagnetic fields, which are, which are Wi-Fi networks. We also use these fields in an MRI scanner. We're using light to look into the soft tissues, the muscles and ligaments inside our body. And it's not only human beings being clever with light. Inside our bodies, the cells communicate, send messages back and forth using photons. We found bacteria colonies using light to send messages back and forth to other colonies. We see fungi and plants communicating with photons. So it's this tremendous means to send information and intelligence back and forth. Much of the behavior of stars, again, doesn't seem like random dead balls of gas. Stars live as couples. They have partners. Now, those romantic astronomers call them binary systems. But most stars have a partner. Occasionally you get three in the relationship. But these two, two stars will orbit around each other. They'll spin around each other like a couple of figure skaters as they travel through the galaxy. And they don't travel alone because stars live in communities. They live in groups of a hundred, thousands of stars, or even five or ten million stars called clusters. And much like we live in, ta in villages, towns, and cities because perhaps they like company. Um, every star also has its own unique signal, its own unique sound it sends out into the galaxy that you can identify that star by its frequencies. And I went to a big science fair in London South Bank a couple years ago and one of the stalls there was headlined Songs of the Stars and you could go there and you can listen to the different stars that they had recorded. Now galaxies too have their own signal, their own wavelengths that they send out. So it's not a cacophony of all the different stars within them. It's their own unified signal. And we've just recently discovered also that galaxies are linked together by electromagnetic fields collecting them across these vast expanses of space. So it really appears that perhaps human beings are not the only example of consciousness in this whole universe. It does appear as if consciousness pervades the entire universe. And when we acknowledge stellar consciousness, it really is the key to the cosmic jigsaw puzzle. So many other things fall into place as a result of it. And by seeing that our galaxy is a joined up network of conscious beings, it's then we don't need things like dark matter to explain its behavior. Dark matter, or as NASA put it, dark matter is the name given to the solution of a problem that hasn't yet been solved. And the problem is, why don't stars why don't galaxies behave like their dumb, stupid matter reacting to nothing but principles expounded by Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein? Um, and why do stars at the outside of a galaxy travel at the same speed as stars at the inside of a galaxy? Well, the so-called fix for this problem is to, to say that 85% of this universe is made up of stuff that we can see through, we can't see it, we can't detect it, we can't find any evidence for its existence, in fact. 85% of the universe. Um, and this is this attempt to deny any consciousness outside of the human brain. Likewise with the multiverse. They think, well, if there is a virtual infinity of universes out there, maybe one of them would have arisen with all the unique properties 
that make this universe hold together as if it's a coordinated intelligent operation. So once we get stellar consciousness, we really have the missing piece of the cosmic jigsaw puzzle. So much of that puzzle makes sense once we put this into the picture. And that's what much of my book, Son of God, is about. It's about the, the inevitable implications of stellar consciousness, what it means in other areas. And it really sheds a lot of light on light itself. Because we discussed the electromagnetic spectrum earlier. And this is everywhere, even in the deepest point of dark space, if you can see a distant galaxy, the electromagnetic force, the light from that galaxy, is at that point in space. And it's the electromagnetic force that gives matter the appearance of being solid, because we now know that from a particle point of view, it's 99% plus empty space. And our sun is the local representative of this divine force, our local agent, so to speak. And light is so, this force is so important to us because the actual energy of life itself is recycled starlight from our local star. That's what our life is. It's light being recycled as the energy of life. And this is the case for trees and jellyfish and people and butterflies. So in a sense, we are all light experiencing its existence as people, as jellyfish, etc. Uh, what fun. And that energy comes, of course, from the vegetable world because as the plants are growing, the energy of the sun is stored in them and it's transferred to animals who eat those plants or animals who eat those animals. That's energy. That's life. And it is that energy that also powers the building of plants, of the entire plant world from the ocean algae to the, to the land mass. Um, because it is a miracle of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis means made by light. And in this process, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are taken out of water and air and recombined as cellulose, as sugars, as proteins, as fats, as carbohydrates. All those building blocks of the vegetable world are created by light. So it's the architect, it's the power source. And it's also within those great engines of light, the stars themselves, that the simplest element in the universe, hydrogen, one little electron circling one proton that we can put in a lighter-than-air balloon, this simple element is converted, transmuted, into carbon, calcium, magnesium, copper, silver, gold, all the elements of the periodic table, everything we need for people and mountains and trees and comets is created within the body of a star. And when you're picking up, if you're staring at Sirius on a dark night, you've got about a thousand photons every second have traveled all the way across 81 trillion miles of space for eight and a half years to reach the back of your eyeball. They haven't lost any energy in, their, in the process because traveling at the speed of light, photons don't experience time. They're there and they're in the back of your eyeball as far as they're concerned. And you are picking up on the vibrations. You are absorbing the vibrations of this divine creature, one of the inhabitants of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So when you're gazing into the mind of the sun. Renew your connection with the source of life and keep that connection with you thereafter and recognize that when your spirits are lifted on a sunny day, it's because you're picking up the original good vibrations from our local divine loving God. Take that with you.